Okay, very warm welcome everyone. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, my name is Sasha Stollanz and I'm the Outreach Officer for the Department of Languages and Cultures here at Lancaster University. And I'm delighted that we are um, going to have an online taster seminar on Chinese today. So I've got my colleagues, um, Dr. Ai Ching Wang and Dr. Derek Hurd with me, who will be leading the session. And um, um, Dr. Wang will be talking about Chinese language and um, I've seen some interesting stuff about the history of Chinese characters. And um, Dr. Hurd will be talking, talking about a cultural aspect, um, something about masculinities in China, which looks really, really fascinating. So I really look forward to that. Um, just a, a couple of housekeeping things. Um, and we're recording this session and we'll upload it to our YouTube channel afterwards. And you can see um, the link to our YouTube channel here. It's Languages and Cultures at Lancaster University. Um, we would like to ask you to please um, keep your microphones and your cameras off. That just really, really helps improve the quality of the call. But um, we would love to hear all your questions and your comments, your thoughts about the seminar. So please use the chat um, to, to write all your questions and your, and your comments. And my colleague, Chris Witter, who's with us as well, he will be monitoring the chat and um, get back to you. And he will be collecting all your questions and then put them to the speakers at the end. We'll reserve around 15 minutes or so at the end for questions and answers. Um, I should say that I am aware that um, it is tricky for some of you to access the chat. There are some problems with the chat if you're from a school that uses um, Teams as well. So your school might have restricted um, the function, the feature that you can access um, sort of like chats from other institutions. We've looked into this and I'm afraid we, there's nothing we can do about it. I'm really sorry about that. But for the majority of you, it should work just fine. So please um, use the chat to share your thoughts with us. Um, and at the end of the session, we'll also show you, give you a link where you can give us some feedback and maybe suggest some, some topics for future seminars and that would be really, really appreciated. And yeah, so without further ado, I'll pass on to Ai Ching. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, ni hao. Uh, my name is Ai Ching Wang. I'm teaching Chinese at the Department of Language and Cultures. I'm very happy today to share some uh, Chinese language uh, knowledge or some interesting facts with you. Right, so let's have a look. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, right, so here we go. I think pr probably uh, some of you know how to greet in Chinese, so it's basically ni uh, hao. So the, the first Pronounce, uh, first character is ni means you and how means well so you well or you good that's the way we uh, greet people in Chinese ni hao okay so you, as you can see here that's a phonetic part uh, the sound part the spelling uh, bit on the top of the Chinese character that's to indicate the sound of this uh, two character of these two characters and the, the characters themselves are the, the, the formal writing system of Chinese. Okay, so it means you good or you well. Okay. So the spelling system is called pinyin. And uh, that's to indicate the syllables of Chinese characters and uh, to indicate how you pronounce the Chinese characters. But uh, in our formal uh, writing system, we don't use this, this spelling, this pinyin, we only use Chinese characters. And the spelling, the, this pinyin system is, helped, uh, is to help us to type, use the keyboard, um, or to teach children and the foreigners to, to learn Chinese. Okay, that's the function of pinyin. Okay. Right, so let's have a look at the pinyin system. So in the pinyin, in one pinyin syllable, there are three parts. The first one is the initial, the so-called consonant. We call that shengwu in Chinese. And the second part is the finals or the so-called vowels in English. And we call that yunwu in Chinese. And the something special is the tone. Right, so we put the consonant and the vowel together and they put the tone mark on top of the vowel to indicate which, uh, which one of the five tones you're talking about. Yeah, so for example, if you have a character hao, which means good or, or well, then 
you can have this consonant, a vowel, and then the uh, tone mark to indicate the whole pinyin. Okay, so let's have a look at the tones. As I said, there are four, or you can argue that there are five basic tones. Um, I would say there are only four or five basic tones, because if you speak Cantonese, you know that there are nine tones in Cantonese. So for Mandarin, it's, uh, it's rather simple, I would say. So only five tones. Uh, the first one is a horizontal one. Uh, second one is a writing tone, rising tone, sorry. The third one is falling and rising tone, and the fourth tone is the falling tone. So I'll show you how to pronounce the four tones. So let's say, let's pronounce ah sound. The first tone would be ah, second one is ah, third one is ah, the fourth one is ah. Right, so you probably, if you sing, you can probably tell, it's, it's tell the difference between the four tones very easily. Right, so uh, as I said, you can argue that there might be four or five tones because the fifth one is a neutral tone. Normally we use the neutral tone to indicate uh, particles, like sentence final particles, ma or ba or, or, or na, to, in, to only indicate some function of the character rather than any specific meaning. So uh, the four tones indicate, uh, each tone indicates something different. For example, if you have this syllable, ma, m and a, ma, and then if you put different tone marks on top of the, this syllable, that indicates something different, right? For example, if you look at this little chart that show you for the, for, um, sorry, for example, the first tone, ma, ma, the horizontal one, and that means mother. Second one, ma, ma, right? That's the rising tone, ma. That's the third one is falling and rising to in, in which means horse, and ma, right? That's the fourth tone, ma, 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 ma. So and ma. So each. So that's why I keep saying to my students that tones are very important in Chinese. Uh, sound system because if you mispronounce the tone, you could well, well, uh, you probably you intended to indicate mother, but what you actually said is horse. So, uh, so if you're learning Chinese, tones are very important to differentiate meanings. Okay, let's have a look at the next slide. The writing system. So the Chinese characters, we call that han zi, han zi. Okay, so as I said, ni, you, that's example of the han zi. Um, so in Chinese, there are, a, there are a great number of Chinese characters. So I would say more than 10,000, if you count the less common ones. But don't panic, don't worry. If you're learning Chinese, you don't actually need to learn more than 10,000 Chinese characters. Because if you only know, uh, like, 3,500 characters, that would be more than enough to cover 99% of all the, the common characters you use in daily life. So you can read books and um, newspapers with only probably about 3,000 very basic characters. Okay, so what are Chinese characters and where do Chinese characters come from and how to learn Chinese characters? Let's have a look. So the very basic, the very original form of Chinese characters is was uh, on the oracle bones. That could date back to 13th century BC. Um, but yeah, the very first, a very initial form of Chinese characters were curved on oracle bones in, uh, like that. Um, so Chinese characters were created in different method from different uh, in different ways. Uh, for example, uh, some of the characters were created based on pictures. Some were created to indicate something. Right. For example, if you look at this picture, that's a woman. 
And this symbol over here is to indicate the image of this woman here. So that image gradually developed into the Chinese character like that, which means female or, or woman. OK, another example is this. That's a child. So this character means child or son. In zi, zi. OK, so there are some other examples like uh, this one. And uh, um, like mountain, oh sorry, that's that's for you to guess actually, for, for we wouldn't have the time. Um, so I'll show you the answers. Yeah, so for example, that one looks like a fire. So it actually, it, it does mean, uh, oh sorry, mountain, and it means mountain. And that's the image of I. So that were those the image were found in um, on the um, oracle bone dating back to 13th century BC, but this is the character we are using nowadays. So you can probably guess the meaning of the character by just looking at the shape of the character. Yeah, for example, that one um, is a tree, and this one is moon, and that one is fire. And the one on the bottom is a door. OK. So I probably need to skip this slide. OK, so if you look at these three characters, the first one is just a one stroke. That means that indicates number one and number two is two strokes and then number three is three strokes. So that's what we call indicative characters because we use different uh, number or shape of strokes to indicate something, to indicate a specific number or some object. Right, so under some examples here, like, um, we can use this image to indicate the sky or that originally four strokes were used to indicate number four, but now the shape has changed and we use this capture nowadays to indicate four. Okay, so another type of Chinese characters is associative characters. Right, so if you have a look at the first image, that means person or people. Um, oh, by the way, you can't, we in Chinese, you can't tell the plural sing singular form by looking at the character. So it could either mean singular person or plural people. But if you put two this such character uh, image together, that means to follow because you have two person, two people. Uh, here and if you put three characters like that, that together that means many or crowd because that's here you, you're using um, the image to indicate or to associate some another image into uh, this one okay so for example if you this image indicates sun and that's moon if you put sun and moon together that means bright okay and another very big type of uh, chinese char uh, chinese characters is picture phonetic characters um about 80 percent of chinese characters fall into this group this means you have part of the character to indicate the sound and the other part to indicate the meaning. For example, this character means mother and the left hand side part indicates the meaning, which means a woman or female. We call that a radical. That, to, that is to categorize Chinese characters based on their meaning. And the uh, right hand side part indicates, uh, um, sorry, is pronounced as ma and the whole character sounds like ma 
So it's, it sounds similar. So the right hand side part is to indicate the sound of this whole character. So we put the meaning and sound together, they form a complete character, and we call this kind of character xing sheng zi, or picture phonetic characters. Right, to, um, then let's have a look at how to learn Chinese characters. So in, in order to write Chinese characters, you need to know there are some basic strokes like dots, uh, horizontal strokes, vertical strokes, etc. And when we are writing the Chinese characters, we need to follow the, the order or the, uh, of the rules of stroke order. For example, we put a horizontal stroke before the vertical stroke or um, to write the top bit, the, the top part uh, first and then the bottom part from left to right, from uh, middle to outside, some etc. OK, so you can if you have a piece of paper and a pen with you, you can give it a go. Uh, for example, the very basic the simplest character in Chinese uh, is Yi. Yeah, Yi means one. Oops. So that's just one horizontal stroke from left to right hand side. And another one, one is very simple. Ren means people or person. So again, that looks like the, the image of a person. Yeah. So that's this is the peer, this stroke, and then na, another stroke. And this character means sun or day. Uh, we need to write this the vertical stroke first, and then the horizontal, vertical, and then something inside, and then the final part. Right, so uh, there are some basic rules how you write Chinese characters. Okay, now let's uh, learn how to uh, say some very basic ch Chinese expressions. Okay, so as I do, I don't know whether you still remember, this is what I mentioned at the beginning. Yi hao, right? So the first one means you, and hao means good or well. So ni hao means you well, you good, which is a way to greet people. Ni hao, ni hao. Okay, to say thank you in Chinese is xie xie. Xie xie. Xie xie. So the first character has a false tone, falling tone, and the second character has a neutral tone. Xie xie. Xie xie means thank you. Okay, so I'll say 谢谢 because I finished my part. I'll, uh, now it's my colleague Dr. Dagger Hurd to introduce some Chinese culture. 谢谢. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ai Ching. That was fantastic. So we should say a big 谢谢 to you. And, 谢谢. Uh, I should say a big ni hao to everybody else. Uh, or I could also say da jia hao, uh, which means how is everybody? Uh, and uh, hello, everybody. So uh, my name is Derek Hurd. I'm the uh, senior lecturer in Chinese in the Department of uh, Languages and uh, Cultures. I'm also deputy director of the Confucius Institute uh, and uh, doing a little bit of uh, a, a sideline as acting head of the Department of Languages and Cultures at the moment. And I'm going to talk to you today uh, about my research. Uh, and the mainstream of my research has been to do with gender, uh, gender in China and specifically masculinities uh, in China. So. What on earth is masculinities uh, research uh, about? Well, it's something to do with the uh, the different ways in which uh, men 
uh, enact uh, their identities as men uh, and uh, talk about their ideas of themselves as men, uh, visualize themselves as men. And of course, not just um, it's not just men feeding into this uh, debate and this uh, conversation. It's women as well. So masculinity is uh, really masculinity studies covers the ways in which uh, uh, men's uh, uh, ways of life, behaviors, and identities are are envisaged and uh, play out. And as you can see uh, from the slide here, there are quite a number of different ways of imagining or enacting uh, Chinese masculinity. Uh, and uh, I put global in there because it's one of the themes I want to emphasize today is the that when we think about Chinese masculinities and Chinese identities generally, we should really be thinking about the global context because the ways in which we imagine ourselves and uh, this is not just applying to Chinese people, but to anybody. Uh, uh, the ways in which we imagine ourselves, the way in which we behave uh, is shaped not just by ideas that are local to the cultural uh, sphere in which we grow up, but uh, uh, are also influenced by ideas and practices that can come from uh, rather far, further away uh, and uh, which can be adapted and uh, transformed along the journey. Let's see if I can move on to the next slide. Hooray. Good. So this chap here, um, the world's first backpacker, uh, could think of him that way, uh, called Xuan Zhang, uh, is one of the, the names he's known by. And here he is appearing on a postage stamp uh, issued in China. And uh, he uh, was uh, one of the early pioneers, not the eldest, but one of the early pioneers of Buddhism in China, uh, round about the start of the Tang Dynasty. Uh, was when he was alive, uh, quite some time ago, as you can see there, 7th century, common era. And why does he have this contraption on his back? Well, it's because he set off on a journey. Buddhism had been established in China for several centuries. I say he wasn't the first, as I said. But a lot of the scriptures from, from India uh, hadn't been brought across uh, to China, hadn't uh, been translated. And uh, Shenzhang was a devout Buddhist, very smart guy, very pr practical guy. And he decided to hike over to, to India, as you do, from China, uh, and uh, pick up a, a lot of scriptures. So he needed something to carry the scriptures in. That's his backpack there. It's got a nice sunshade over the top. And uh, he, he traveled on foot, uh, by horse, uh, uh, all the way from uh, Chang'an, modern day Xi'an. Uh, through, uh, here's a map now, he, so he, he traveled all the way through uh, the northwest of the country and uh, uh, of China, Xinjiang now across the desert area there, the Taklamakan Desert, um, and uh, through Kashgar, uh, there we go, the top, the top line, uh, the top line there is um, through Tashkent, because he took slightly different routes on the way to India and the way back. The top, the top, uh, the northernmost route going through uh, Uzbekistan, uh, current uh, modern day Uzbekistan, Tashkent, Samarkand, and down towards Afghanistan, and then pa modern day Pakistan, and towards uh, India. Then eventually over to northeast India, to where Buddhism is flourishing and picking up the scriptures. He spent many years. Uh, in India and was a very influential figure in Buddhist philosophical debates there before heading back to China. Now, he'd actually sneaked out of China at a time when people were not supposed to leave China. And so uh, he's a bit nervous about going back. But after he, his uh, exploits, uh, his amazing achievements were, were discovered, the emperor welcomed him back with uh, open arms. And uh, he then spent the rest of his life in Xi'an, Currently, Xi'an, uh, with a team of people translating many 
uh, uh, scriptures into Chinese. So uh, here we can see uh, an example of how a, a Chinese man and a kind of Buddhist masculinity, if we like, that's very global in a sense, or at least very regional, uh, how you have going along the, the, the Silk Road uh, to get to India and uh, learning many languages uh, and picking up many cultural pieces of knowledge along the way. Now, uh, if we move, if I can get the cursor to, oh, there we go. On to the next uh, slide. Uh, some of you may have heard of the, the Chinese uh, tale, uh, Journey to the West. Uh, you may not know that it's uh, based on and, and grows out of the, the real life figure of Xuanzang that I just talked about. Uh, and uh, this was an oral tale that was passed down from generation to generation in the centuries after uh, Xuanzang had traveled to, to India. Uh, and then was eventually written down uh, towards the end of the uh, Ming Dynasty and printed as you know, technology was evolving and uh, readership for uh, uh, for books, printed books was expanding and uh, uh, a printed version was made available uh, around about the end of the 16th century. And uh, these days, of course, there are many television adaptations and film series and cartoons and so on. Here's a, a, a photograph from, from one of them, and that's Xuanzang uh, on the horse there, or he's known as Tang Song, usually the monk of the Tang dynasty. In, uh, is another name that he's often known by. And there's in the yellow there is a monkey who is a very mischievous character. Uh, some say he, he sort of represents the untamed mind that needs to be uh, uh, brought into training through Buddhist uh, meditation and uh, other forms of uh, Buddhist cultivation. Uh, hol holding onto the horse there is Pigsy. Uh, uh, you know, he's uh, a figure who represents the base desires of uh, uh, humanity, the greed and, and so on. Uh, and, and so he's quite a humorous figure. And then towards the back there with the pole across his uh, shoulder is uh, Sandy, who's quite a down to earth, uh, uh, less sort of extroverted character uh, and, and does play a role in mediating between the different uh, figures there. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating story. Uh, it's traveled. This story has traveled to the West and, and, and some of the uh, ideas in it have made their way into popular culture in the West. Um, uh, of course, it's been translated. Uh, the monkey figure is sometimes thought to have derived from Hanuman, the, uh, the Hindu uh, 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 figure in, 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 in Indian uh, sagas. So uh, here we can see another global uh, uh, dimension to this uh, story. Uh, just to keep the Indian theme going, uh, here's a, 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 a monk from India called Bodhidharma, who uh, lived even earlier than uh, Xuanzang. So he was alive in the early fifth century. And he traveled from India to China at that time to help with the establishment of uh, Buddhism in China. And uh, he uh, is very well known for uh, sitting in a cave for many years uh, uh, in a place fairly near Xi'an, uh, um, a, bit of, a bit to the east, uh, and where, uh, where they established the Shaolin Temple. And so Bodhidharma is uh, known almost uh, always as uh, the key figure in the establishment of this wonderful temple. You may have heard of the Shaolin Temple. Uh, and one of the, uh, the gifts that Bodhidharma brought with him was this uh, idea of, well, this is, so the story goes, of training up the monks uh, there in some kind of um, defensive martial arts so that they could protect the uh, temple uh, from you know, brigands and other uh, 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 evil doers, uh, and so this is, brings us to another kind of Chinese masculinity that's become very prominent globally, and has certainly had a huge influence. You think about Hollywood films, for example, in the contemporary era, uh, the kinds of martial arts uh, influences there. So uh, uh, 
this kind of masculinity uh, in China, a kind of martial, uh, skillful fighting masculinity, is often thought of or characterized as being based on the notion of Wu. Uh, and uh, that's the character on the right there, Wu. And it's often associated with a, a kind of uh, a kind of physical prowess and uh, you know a kind of rough, tough, uh, hard drinking, meat eating, uh, uh, kind of uh, robust uh, masculinity. Uh, there is another kind of masculinity called a win masculinity, which is also very prominent in historical uh, literature, uh, and that's a much uh, uh, softer kind of uh, notion of. Uh, uh, striving for a kind of cultural attainment and then that could be through learning poetry, um, uh, uh, learning the uh, reading the Confucian classics uh, and uh, really uh, being able to sort of shape one's behavior in a, in a very cultivated way. So Win and Wu are seen as the two pillars of, uh, of Chinese masculinity historically uh, and these days, of course, things are not quite so simple, and uh, the world is a very complex place. And but there's still a bit of win and woo uh, going around in China, and you can still see it influencing contemporary masculinities. Uh, China is a great place for bringing in uh, aspects of the past. You know, this is part of the. Uh, a sort of well embedded cultural practice in, in China is uh, references and reworking of ideas and uh, practices from the past. And Confucius, of course, would be one of the key figures there. Now, he's associated with the win uh, masculinity because he represents this sort of cultivated, well disciplined uh, embodiment of, of learning and uh, the prioritization of study. Uh, which, uh, you know, that's one of the the notions that is, is often trotted out when we think about uh, China these days is of, is, you know, the emphasis on education. And in fact, this goes back a long way. So that's uh, uh, Confucius. And of course, Confucius gave rise to a whole school of thought called Confucianism that was developed over the centuries and the millennia. One of the key figures that uh, emerged uh, uh, during that development was this notion of the Junzi. Now, the Junzi is the Confucian gentleman. Uh, so, it, the Confucian gentleman is seen as the epitome of a win masculinity, thoroughly cultivated, with a deep moral sense of what's right and wrong, knows his roles and responsibilities in the family, and knows how to relate also to people outside the family, superior in government, for example. And there's a whole process of self-cultivation called Xiu Shen that's involved in that. So let's come up to date uh, and uh, look at the contemporary period. And what have we seen in recent years? We've seen a boom in the Chinese economy, especially since the 1990s, when Deng Xiaoping and others uh, so who were supportive of the acceleration of the marketization of the Chinese economy uh, were able to implement some policies uh, as part of their economic reforms that really helped push um, the globalization of the Chinese economy. And what do you need these days? You need armies of white collar people to fill the offices, professionals, lawyers, the accountants and so on, uh, who um, keep the global economy spinning. So here we have the emergence of the besuited office going and sophisticated white collar man. Um, uh, of course, uh, that involves a particular kind of masculinity, doesn't it? There's a certain look, uh, a very clean, uh, well presented look. There's a certain way of speaking. Uh, it's it's a, a bit of a far cry from that robust uh, woo martial art masculinity that we're talking about. Certainly more to the win side, in a sense. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, the research that I've done and others have done shows that some Chinese male urban middle class men, so this is urban areas, these white collar men, they're increasingly turning to notions of uh, cultural uh, attainment from uh, uh, the centuries uh, gone by. Uh, and the Conf Confucian moral exemplar, the Junzi, is one of the key 
archetypes that Chinese men are turning to as they seek a kind of special identity for themselves. They may look very Western in suits and uh, in, in terms of some uh, hobbies uh, and, uh, and, and so on. But um, there's a deep sense, and there has been a deep sense since the 19th century, since the encounter with the West, of trying to preserve and develop a sense of Chineseness and what it means to be a Chinese person. And the white collar men in China are also engaged in this process. So it's not simply that we can say that Western modernity has arrived in China and changed China. In fact, China is modernizing in its own way as it goes along. And uh, the identities, the masculinities that are emerging are quite complex and involve uh, cosmopolitan notions that circulate around the world, but also uh, deeply embedded historical ideas. Now, along with that uh, uh, Im embedding of historical uh, Confucian ideas comes a danger, of course, that some of the historical gender and class hierarchies might be reproduced. There's a Buddhist turn in, uh, in China as well during the reform era. Uh, particularly among the middle class, among entrepreneurs, Tibetan Buddhism, exotic, alluring, uh, spiritually pure, seen as an escape from the pressures and anxieties of doing business in big city life. Money isn't everything. Uh, these kind of uh, tropes have come to the, the fore. Uh, monks have become a success on social media, uh, peddling uh, various uh, notions of uh, uh, Buddhist um, practice that can help uh, alleviate uh, the pressures of everyday life. And speaking of social media, has anybody got into Chinese social media? It's absolutely amazing, fascinating world. And um, recently I've been doing some research on Chinese male beauty vlogs. Now we know that beauty vlogging has taken off in the West and uh, some of you may also know that it's taken off in China as well, in a huge way, including male beauty vlogging. Here's an example here, Dong Zichu. What's going on? Well, we've got the rise of the consumer economy in China. The male beauty industry is increasing in size at a huge uh, 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 rate in China, uh, outstripping the growth uh, in the West. And there's some speculation that this may be linked into the win masculinity. Some of the models of win masculinity in Chinese history of young men were really about young men taking care of their appearance and wearing makeup. Uh, there's a high use of digital social media in China, as I think we most of us know. There's a, an increasing boom in the creative industries in China. The government is really promoting uh, development there. So social media is uh, developing and one of the new masculinities that have emerged uh, has emerged is this uh, Xiao Xian Rou, uh, the little fresh meat masculinity, uh, which is a young boy band type uh, masculinity uh, as exemplified in this picture here, which is extremely popular with uh, female audiences in China. Uh, now, in terms of how uh, male beauty vloggers are interpreting uh, or creating new ways of uh, uh, displaying masculinities, if you like, or identities, uh, here's an, a, a, a very interesting example. So there's a, a beauty vlogger called Wang Ran Ar. He uh, is very popular, almost a million fans on Weibo, one of the big uh, social media platforms in China. Uh, and he has interpreted um, uh, uh, a film uh, look from Tui Hart. Tui Hart's a Hong Kong director and he did a 1993 film uh, 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 called Green Snake, which itself is a reworking of a novel by a Hong Kong writer, which itself is also a reworking of an ancient Chinese folktale called White Snake. Let's focus on the male beauty vlogger. So he's taken some of the ideas from Chinese opera and from Chinese painting about expressing a kind of spiritual essence about it's it, it, the the opera performance 
and the artist's performance, if you like, when he paints, when he or she paints, is about the expression, a kind of spontaneous spiritual uh, engagement with the landscape or with the scene and the plot, uh, and the story of the of the opera. Uh, and he's tried to capture that in this and some of the aesthetics associated with that. And here you can see he talks about giving a Chinese classical charm to the eyebrows uh, and he's incorporated the Peking opera elements. into. So he's got a whole video on how he created this look. So what does this hark back to? The Nandan, female impersonating boy actors, very popular in late 19th century Peking opera. So Wang Ran are is bringing these kind of aesthetic ideas from uh, Peking opera in the imperial period into the uh, contemporary male beauty vlogging. Now, if you put on makeup as a man, uh, so what, right? Some of you might say, and quite rightly so. Uh, some men, however, some young men, mostly want to wear makeup, uh, but feel uh, a little bit um, anxious about whether their so-called masculinity will be diminished or not. But fear not, because on the Chinese male beauty vlogs, there's a whole uh, s series of uh, videos by many vloggers which uh, uh, show you how to put on makeup in a way that nobody else, nobody will know you're wearing makeup. And it's called straight man fake natural makeup. So you can maintain your masculinity intact. Nobody will call you a sissy and uh, you will, um, uh, you'll, but you will look better and improve your chances of uh, getting that job or getting a good partner or whatever uh, that you, you, you're aiming for. That's how they, they sell this. Now, of course, this raises the question of um, what's wrong with being called a sissy in the first place, right? Or what's wrong with being slightly feminine? Uh, so they are pandering to that, uh, uh, what we could call sissy-phobic um, market. So that, that is problematic because it reinforces um, this idea that, uh, you know, men shouldn't be seen to be wearing makeup. But as academics, as researchers, we need to study these phenomena and, and see where they go. And here's one of the successful uh, uh, proponents of uh, fake makeup. So you can't see it, he says. You straight men can boldly wear makeup. No need to fear being called a sissy. And he has uh, many fans on Bilibili, another a, a video sharing platform that's very popular. So I just want to conclude to, by saying that uh, what I've shown you today, I think, gives you a flavor of what Chinese masculinities are and how they've changed and the kind of um, ways they have developed uh, over time. They're, they're plural, that's for sure. Uh, hybrid in the sense that they have many different components and they're changing. They're not static. They draw on contemporary and historical ideas. They draw on globally circulating as well as locally embedded ideas. Uh, and they both challenge gender, existing gender ide identities, some of the more extreme makeup we've seen, but they reinforce them at the same time. If you, you know, if you think about that idea of keeping one's masculinity, straight masculinity intact, it's a fascinating area to study. So I shall finish there and we shall open up the uh, discussion uh, to any questions about language, uh, culture, uh, study at Lancaster. And thanks for listening to me. You may. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Derek. <laughs> I'm just going to switch my video back on. There I am again. Thank you very much to both Derek and to I Ching for these really, really fascinating um, presentations. Um, and um, I think um, there, there's been a few, there have been a few questions in the chat, which is fantastic. And um, I think Chris has been collecting them. Now, while um, Chris is, um, is getting ready for the Q&A, um, just to briefly say that um, if you would like to suggest any um, topics for future seminars, almost like it's gone, doesn't matter. Um, if you'd like to suggest any topics for future seminars, um, there is a link for this and it's tiny.cc slash languages feedback. I've just put it in the in the chat again. And um, in the feedback, oh, there it is again, perfect. In the feedback from last week, um, quite a few said that they would love to learn more about our um, degree programs and um, what it's like to study with us. Of course, that's something we'd be happy to talk about. And um, the next best occasion for this is um, our upcoming open days. 
So our next um, open day will be on the 26th of June, I think it's the last Saturday in June, 27th of June. And um, it will obviously have to be online, but um, it will be a meeting like this and we'll be able to answer all your questions about um, what it's like to study with us and what kind of degrees we offer. Um, and I've put a link in the chat for that as well. Okay, now um, over to Chris for the questions. Thanks, Sasha. Um, sorry to get rid of your slides as well. Um, I've got that slide right. at the very end of this, so I'll put that up again. Um, okay, so we had a few questions. Um, and the first one was for I Ching. Um, I was just wondering if you could tell us any more about the oracle bones, um, where they're from, what they were created for, and so on. Okay, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, those uh, the oracle bones were um, because in ancient times people have we haven't invented paper yet. Oh, by the way, uh, paper is one of the four great inventions of in ancient China. Uh, so before the invention of paper, people used um, turtle shells to to keep record of um, their like very basic ideas and their the numbers. For example, and uh, so they use turtle shells to, uh, they use knives to, to draw like very basic images on turtle shells, dates back from the 13th century BC, um, and then gradually those images uh, in, re evolve into characters like what I showed you. There are some images like real life object, and then gradually they they change the the image into characters. And the, the, the characters or in the in images on Oracle Born is called Jia Gu Wen. So that was the very basic form of tra traditional uh, Chinese characters. Um, so people can still recognize some Jia Gu Wen because they still look like the characters we use nowadays. So that I would say that's the beauty of Chinese writing system because you don't we don't know how people in ancient time can pronounce those characters, but we can tell the basic, the rough meaning of the characters simply by the, the image of the, the Chinese characters. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, um, while you were talking, I Ching, Derek commented in the chat that um, the origins of the characters provide vivid ways of memorizing how to write the characters. Um, and I was wondering if, if there are any characters that have stories associated with them um, in relation to that idea of there being vivid ways of memorizing. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, um, the character for good, well, is Hao. Uh, the, on the left hand side is the image for woman. On the right, um, yeah, right hand side is an image for child. So in ancient times, people think if in the in your house there's a woman holding a baby, that's a good thing. That's a that would bring um, that that means you have a new life in your household, and, and that that's good. So that image indicates good. Mm -hmm. So a woman holding a baby is the the character good. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, there may be other questions coming up in the chat. Unfortunately, I can't see that and the presentation at the same time. So um, I'll move on for now to a question for Derek from Catherine, which was, um, you're going to have to forgive my pronunciation here. How long would um, Chuan Zhang's journey have taken? Oh, that was perfect pronunciation. Um, uh, I, I'm afraid I don't know the answer. The, it, clearly months and months and months, uh, possibly over a year. Uh, he had to go all the way along the Silk Road, uh, which was a burgeoning trade route. Um, and it was also a route where there was, uh, uh, it was military uh, activity, uh, missionary activity, uh, diplomatic activity. So there's all sorts of people passing up and down the... Uh, uh, the, the Silk Road, and uh, you'd to go through several countries, many countries, uh, many different languages, and so on. So gaining the 
patronage, protection of local leaders and so on. Uh, this would have taken quite a lot of time. Uh, so um, uh, many, 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 many months. Uh, that, that's uh, for sure. I'm afraid I don't have a more accurate uh, uh, figure than that. I'm sure the the uh, the answer will be available somewhere online. Uh, uh, there's a lot written about uh, Shenzhen. Okay, um, we had a, lo a lot of uh, interesting questions about masculinities. Um, so uh, here was one question. Um, a masculinity based on, on cultural attainment and martial valour sounds like a very aristocratic ideal. So did other um, pre-modern ideas of masculinity exist that were rooted in different um, class experiences? Yeah, that's a very good uh, question. So the uh, quite right, cultural attainment is very aristocratic in a way, or certainly for elite educated men uh, of whom the there was only a small percentage uh, in uh, China historically. So uh, that, that, that idea of becoming a Junza was limited to uh, um, a, a small uh, section of Chinese society. Uh, yes, historically, the martial valor uh, was associated with these uh, generals and heroes. So again, a sort of high level elite uh, a notion. However, as time went by, um, the, this kind of Wu masculinity, the, 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 the robust masculinity, became more and more associated also with a figure called the Hao Han. And the Hao Han is, is a, a sort of uh, uh, Robin Hood almost type figure in, his, in, in some of the ways he's been imagined, most famously depicted in the, the novel The Water Margin also known as Outlaws of the Marsh. And that was a band of outlaws who set up in the mountains in the marshes uh, and, and, and lived a sort of brawling uh, uh, life uh, uh, of um, uh, trying to uh, uh, you know, uh, bring fairness to situations uh, in a little bit Robin Hoodish, you know, in, in where, where injustice had, had prevailed. And they had a, a lot of run-ins with uh, uh, the authorities. Uh, and that kind of uh, uh, physical uh, 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 masculinity uh, was certainly much more associated with the lower classes of men. Great, uh, thank you for that. That's really interesting. Um, Sasha was also asking, um, how do you think Chinese uh, and perhaps Asian more broadly ideas of masculinity um, might differ from European ideas or ideas in other parts of the world? Well, one, one way in which they, they differed historically, and it's quite interesting to see, is this, what the, the Hao Han that I've just described. Uh, he was a figure uh, who, uh, whose, whose reputation and characteristics uh, were based on his fighting ability, his camaraderie, his loyalty to his, his, his uh, fellow uh, outlaws, male outlaws, uh, and, and you know, and there was the hard drinking and the meat eating that I talked about earlier. But one thing they had to do was keep away from women because women were seen as a dangerous uh, temptation uh, and uh, a way in which they might be uh, be led to betray that kind of group loyalty and solidarity and of that, that brotherhood that had been developed. And if we think about the uh, the the knight, for example, in the West, this chivalrous uh, figure, he's always trying to rescue the girl or go after the, you know, there's the, there's this romantic uh, involvement in the stories involving knights. So there's there's some kind of difference in terms of the relationship with women uh, that was um, uh, that that we can say characterise some of these earlier forms of masculinity. Thanks very much. Um, it's really interesting. Um, let's move on a little bit. So, um, you, when you were talking about um, social media and masculinities on social media, Cyril asked, um, could you tell us about how homosexuality is viewed in China? Is it accepted? And do emerging forms of masculinity indicate acceptance or growing acceptance? Well, uh Fascinating question. Homosexuality wasn't, uh, there wasn't a, a homosexual identity per se, historically in China, but there certainly was homosexual behavior. Uh, and uh, it, 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 you know, if you were a, a rich man, uh, you might have a male, a young male lover, 
as, as you would be married, of course, because everybody got married, had kids, and you might have many female concubines. You might also have uh, a young male lover uh, that's written about in the literature from centuries past. Uh, coming into the, the current era, uh, well, um, uh, I don't want to say that uh, it, historically it uh, all was well and rosy if you had uh, uh, homosexual relations. There was certainly still some uh, um, notion of um, uh, that there was something uh, rather unusual about it uh, and not within the, the norms. Um, coming into the 20th century uh, with Western ideas entering China, which were in the early 20th century, were very uh, anti-homosexual. Uh, uh, this, this influenced debates uh, and uh, ideas and laws in China. So the, 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 the climate changed uh from the uh, from the 19th century where the the, the the female impersonating boy actors from the uh, uh the peking opera were often associated with homosexuality that there was a mood change against that kind of culture coming into the 20th century uh during the socialist era under mao um it wasn't a great time to be homosexual and uh, there, there, there were certain laws we used to prosecute them. We come into the uh, the late 20th century, uh, early 21st century, and the laws begin to uh, be uh, relaxed and uh, homosexuality is no longer a uh, uh, prosecuted uh, per se. But at the same time, there is not a positive framework of legal acceptance and um, in that sense of uh, uh, trying to support uh, equal rights. So that we're in a kind of area where it's not necessarily illegal, uh, but uh, there are still uh, big uh, challenges in, in terms of its acceptance. Uh, uh, so um, the Jun, I'll just take the other questions as well briefly. The, the Junza uh, idea doesn't really include homosexuality explicitly because the Junza uh, gets, the Junza is in his complete form is a married man. Uh, now, as I said, he, there may be some a, a possibility of having a young male lover on the side, but that wouldn't, that's not the part of the Junza uh, image in terms of the, the, the core characteristics. Uh, and emerging neutral androgynous gender identity, that's certainly uh, happening. I think we see it happening in the West, the blurring of gender identities. We can see that happening in China as well. And um, some of the ways in which the, yes, there is a, a more of an androgynous gender identity uh, 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 emerging in China is, is, is through uh, pop music, popular culture and, and some of the shows. But there's always it's, it's a push and pull kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a, there, there are some uh, innovations and then there's a pushback from more conservative elements in society. So but very lively situation and developing. Great, thank you, Derek. That's really interesting. Uh, I'll just see if there are any other questions in the. So there were a couple of questions, but maybe um, we can deal with them by email later. If if that if those people would just like to email us, because there were about there was one question about um, can you recommend any online um, resources to um, to study Chinese, and the second question was about um, our degree programs and what kind of opportunities there are to go to China and spend some time in China. I don't know, Derek, if you want to briefly talk about that or otherwise, yeah. if, that, if you could yeah. send us an email, we can send you more detailed information about that as well. Yes, we are putting uh, online material uh, for our, uh, our Chinese online uh, material on our Confucius Institute website. Uh, so if you have a look at that, you'll see some online uh, uh, material there. Uh, so we'll be sharing videos, language and cultural videos there. Lots of very interesting stuff going to be coming onto that site. There's already some stuff up. Uh, in terms of opportunities to go to China, uh, we, we we are uh, expanding our Chinese studies program at the moment so that we're, we're going to start Chinese as a major uh, uh, this uh, coming academic year, which means that when 
the, that cohort of students reaches their third year, they will go abroad for a, a year to China. At the moment, where China has been taught as a, as a minor option, and we've sent students abroad for several months, uh, fitted in around their other commitments, uh, and uh, they've studied and gained qualifications in uh, some of our partner institutions in China, uh, and there are scholarships also available for that. So plenty of opportunities, plenty of flexibility to get abroad, get out to China. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. Oops, can't even see me. Here I am again. Thank you very much to Derek. Thank you very much to I Ching. Thanks to Chris and thanks to everyone for coming. Um, so next week we're going to have a seminar on Spanish and then the week after Italian. And then finally we're doing a seminar on translating and interpreting. So please do join us again. And yeah, it was great to see so many of you here. It's, it's fantastic to see such an um, interesting uh, session on different languages and such, an, such a really good turnout to these sessions. So thank you very much for that. Thanks to all of you and goodbye. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I tried. Thank you.